Hey, what is up, everybody? My name is Mario Pichardo. Welcome to another episode of Methods. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about politics. It is something that I love to talk about because it's just something that I think I find myself really gravitating towards. And I wonder how much of that just has to do with like the emotion associated with it. It's a very polarizing topic right now. And getting involved in the conversation or having a chance to speak about it is <laughs> really gratifying. It feels really good. So, you know, look, you know, you have your Republicans and your Democrats and everybody kind of has their own side and they have something that they either do or do not want to talk about. And, you know, things are, things are really polarizing right now. Things are very, you're either pro Trump or you're, or you're a never Trumper. And it's kind of funny how people are getting split up and divided uh, along political, kind of along political lines, where you have people who are diehard, you know, you have the, the, the diehard, we have to do things about climate change, we have to stop that, we have to stop, what's the other, we have to give all of these amenities to transgender folk, LGBT being taught in schools, and this whole kind of line of trying to push on people, you got to believe this, you got to believe that. Um, it's funny to look at like the, which side is doing what, you know, which side is the side that's saying, oh, you have to do things this way, you can't really deviate from this established paradigm of how we do things. Uh, you know, the left, the left is loves to talk about what you can and cannot do. But at the same time, um, doesn't follow their own rules, they'll call you out for being fascist or for trying to get something shut down. But when they do fascist things or ideas, it's totally fine. No one raises uh, the alarm. No one says anything. No one calls out the contradictions. And you see a lot of complicity with mainstream media, news sources. And it gets frustrating after a while because you see it and you think to yourself, really, is this what we're doing now? We're going to let all of this go by and not try to curb it at, at some angle at some stop and try to say okay you know maybe we shouldn't do this because um you know we should live by some principles and i think you know politics really gets people stirred up because when you when it gets down to the hypocrisy of of it all where you have that kind of well, you were arguing this, but now you're arguing that. Like, I don't really understand where you're coming from, what's going on. Um, this, the, the sides really change, and it's all about power. And when you see the people who want to be in power finally get in power, they don't do anything. Or at least they don't seemingly do a lot of things. And, you know, we really have a big problem, I think, as far as public service is concerned, because... The I think the one really stark issue with people serving in public office is the level of accountability, because it's very easy when you're in office to say, well, you know, we tried to do something about, um, let's say, I don't know, there, there's, there's uh, poison water. You know, we tried to do something about the poison water, but... Um, this other group didn't, you know, the Congress didn't push it or didn't support it or they didn't vote for it. They wanted to vote for this. So in a way, politics is very kind of 
quid pro quo. It's very, you do something for me, then I'll do something for you, maybe. Um, and we can both get something that we really want. Otherwise, neither of our needs are going to get met. Um, you're not going to get what you want. I'm not going to get what I want. And then we're both all the poorer for that. And we kind of have to live in this paradigm of deciding, all right, well, we can either comp make some compromises, which is kind of probably what you do want. When you have, um, you know, people who have all these different responsibilities, when you bring people from California to write, legisla reg write legislation alongside people from Nebraska, they're going to have very different ideas of what they want for as per their constituent. So you would assume, yes, you'd get some level of um, quid pro quo. You do me a favor, I'll do you a favor. Um, but there's also a level deeper than that, I think, where when you have groups of people who are, um, you know, there, you have to think about what's best for um, everybody. And I think, you know, when you look at even, even, so even when we look at the federal level, um, policy at the federal level, because it encompasses people from all different walks of life, from all different parts of the country, in a country that's really, really large, should really probably be limited for that very factor, right? The bigger that you go, there's no reason that the federal government, for example, should have control over um, what's being taught in schools because it's the equivalent of Great Britain way yonder back in the day telling the colonialists what you, you know deciding the rules deciding their how what what, what commerce will cost what um, to decide social legislation when they don't even live alongside the people that they claim to quote unquote represent. Um, and so, you know, when you have very Christian, for example, states like the, 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 the belt, the Bible belt, and you have a very progressive Congress or you have their, uh, you know, majority Congress who are, let's just say progressive, um, if you have legislation or you push legislation that is saying LGBT must be taught everywhere, well, that's going to be a big problem for people living in Christian areas. They don't believe in this. You know, this is not the gospel to them. And to push that legislation is to really kind of dig your heels into something that you really have to ask the question, is it right for us um, to force other people's kids, because that's really what we're doing, to be taught these things because we believe them, even though they, do, they don't. And the interesting thing, I think, that when you get into that is, well, if you wouldn't teach another person, if you wouldn't force that upon another race, right? Like, let's say you would say, all right, well, we'll teach it to these people, but we, will, but we won't teach it to the Indians, we won't force blacks people to to have to go through this because of you know the intersectionality well why do we feel like we should infringe those ideas we should push or those ideas and infringe on the rights of other people at all if we're trying to be respectful of people's race if we're trying to be respectful of people people's um, cultures then why can't we be respectful of people's religion and why can't we be respectful for, for a person's um, individualism or right to decide for themselves what they want to teach their kids? What happened to that? And, you know, and this is why, you know, I thought and I still think it was a big mistake that we don't have mothers in the home because if you don't have mothers in the home, you don't have, you, the, the state raises your kids. And you never want the state to raise your kids. You don't want the state to tell your kids this or that or that they should believe this or they should believe that because 
child rearing is something that really I think needs a lot of love and I think it really needs a lot of care and there's just no two people who know the kid well enough to properly rear them than the parents and it's certainly not going to be some bureaucrat from 20, 30, 400, 500, 600 miles away, thousands of miles away in another country or another state. Who are the people of California to decide, to decide what, the, what the kids in Georgia public schools are being taught? They have radical, radically different ideas of what is normal, uh, what is socially and culturally acceptable. And it makes sense because when you look at, you know, at a, a geographic map, we have states that are so far apart from one another. Yeah, you know, they have kind of di different cultures. Now, that's kind of not as prominent now because, you know, social media and stuff like that. But they do still have their own inherent cultures and their own inherent um, ideologies and beliefs. And who are we to step into these places and say, yeah, no, we're going to change this. I'm going to teach your kid this um, instead of what you've always been teaching them because, you know, I want to do that. So I'm going to do it. You know, it's kind of crazy and you, we can't let it happen and we shouldn't let it happen. We should want to maintain control over our own lives. So really, the federal government should have very limited control over what it over the power that that it that that it uses over the people the smaller the big government the better now you can quickly run into issues where it comes into regulation for certain things but this is kind of where look there's a lot of gray area right it's the only way that our government got as big as it was was because, well, there's a lot of gray area. You know, you can't say that the government starts here and should stop here. I mean, you can, but there is a lot of gray. You know, it's like, think about meat, for example. You want to have regulations on meat, right? You want to make sure meat is safe. 20, 30 years ago, we didn't know that the internet would be a thing. We didn't know that our kids would have very easy access to, you know, adult themes. Uh, right at their fingertips and stuff like that. So you don't want n no regulation at all. You know, you want to know that if whatever supermarket you go to, that the meat is going to be, um, you know, as as healthy as can be. You want to know that, um, you know, there's not a, asbestos in your in your baby products. So you you want to know that these things are real for you. Um, so, you know, you also, don't, you, you, you can't go without government entirely, right? And, but, but we don't know where really the line is. We didn't know that the internet would be a thing. Should we regulate it? I say no, but who knows? Maybe at some point down the line, we don't know. We didn't know the internet would exist a little, a couple decades ago. So even though we may not need to regulate it now, maybe in the future we will. Maybe, I don't know, you know, and so look, while you're not quick to say the, the line should start here and stop here, you also don't want to say uh, that, the, that uh, you know, you, you want to give some wiggle room. So really where it comes down to is, and is for a stable society, for, for a really strong society, it comes down to, um, I think, religious values. And the reason that I say that, if you want a strong and safe society, is you want to look at your Christian Judeo values, and you want to look at what those Christian Judeo values are trying to espouse in your world. And, and so when you look at Christianity, treat your neighbor like yourself. Take care of the other person around you. And so, so the intent behind the things that you're doing is different. As to where in one angle you might say, um, you know, I want to, uh, you know, it, it, it's essentially the ethos of saying, um, all right, I'm not going to be selfish. I'm going to try to be as helpful and open as I can. And I'm not going to try to sit here and force you to do something. 
you know, and one of the ways, okay, well, what's one of the ways that, you know, you can espouse that? Well, look, let, let's look at the legislation, right? Let's look at more socialist ideas. Um, and on one hand, socialism sounds very Christian because it's about um, sharing more with everybody, right? That no person should be, should not have to have, um, should have to live without health care, that no person should have to live without um, X, Y, and Z, without a home, for example, um, and all these things, right? They sound great, but where, but the reason that it's not Christian, the reason that it's not good, the reason that it's not something that we want to implement is because, yes, you know, love your neighbor, but there's also a level of autonomy in that. You can't put a gun to your neighbor's head and say, you have to do this. And, you know, what's one of our other Christian Judeo values? You know, loving your neighbor so you don't take from them, you don't steal from them. Socialism is about a lot of stealing. It's taking the assets of your neighbor. And so, you know, when if, if we go back and we say, let's found a country on Christian Judeo values and stick to them, how different would that look from what we have today? And the Constitution, our United States Constitution, is that. It is the pinnacle display of what um, a Christian Judeo value system would look like when, when implemented in the real world. There's a, a separation, right? There's a checks and balance system. There's rights inherent to the individual that the person may be able to freely express who they are or what they, what they might say, and that there wouldn't be restrictions on what a person could or could not say. The reason for that being that, yeah, is, is so that the government itself doesn't become the arbiter of, of, of over the lives of the people, so that, so that the people would be allowed to choose. You know, it's a very, very Christian idea that an individual would be able to choose for themselves the path that they're going to walk down, the things that they're going to do, and that we minimize really this kind of overarching government control or bureaucracy. So, you know, it's interesting, but we really want to sit back and say, um, what, what's the best that we can do? for ourselves, for our society. And um, it, it really starts, a lot of people look at it and say the policy is the problem that we're trying to do this. No, it's, it's, it's a cultural problem. And it's that we've in a lot of ways become morally bankrupt, where um, I think a lot of society is looking, to, looking for outrage, they're looking for social, social points by pointing out how certain groups are marginalized compared to other groups. Um, they're looking for equality um, or, or looking for any perceivable instance of inequality to point to and to point other groups out, out by. But what they're not doing is judging an individual by their actions. You know, they're choosing to judge people by class distinctions. Um, and I think that that's a very bad idea because... Yes, you know, there are class distinctions for sure, and there are social social um, characteristics, but they do not define the person. You know, God never said in our Bible that you can go to heaven because you're black or you can't go because you're white. It's choosing to go was or was about obedience and putting your some putting yourself on that razor's edge. It had nothing to do with how much money you made. It had nothing to do with any of these other factors. And so that same sort of meritocratic system, when carried over into the real world, yes, there will always be inequalities. It's it's actually a very human nature thing. Hierarchies have been around for for all time. You think about God, if you believe in God. And if you don't believe in God, let's say you believe in creation, you believe in the creation theory. If you if you believe in creation, hierarchies have been around ever since life has existed, where there's been a food chain, 
then certain people have said at the top. Certain people would point at that and say, that, well, that's an inequality. And it is. It's, it's inherent. There's, an, there's inequalities everywhere. There's inequalities. There, there's things that aren't uniform. Um, if, if I have $2 and you have $2 and I spend my $2 on a chocolate bar and eat the chocolate bar, we're automatically unequal. Now there's an inequality. Let's say we both started a business, your business, you were selling tires and, um, you know, by chance, the person who had a million dollars to spend and wanted to buy a tire business, found yours first, bought yours, you all of a sudden have a million dollars now. And I'm still trying to sell tires, maybe I make five, six hundred dollars a week. And so, you know, you're way better off than I am. That's an inequality just happened. Now we're unequal. But it wasn't because you did anything bad. I just missed out by luck. So there's a lot, and that happens, I'm sure, a lot more frequently than we realize that things kind of just happen by luck. You know, things just happen by luck. I'm not saying you're going to be a millionaire. Like, it, like that happens really frequently. But the fact that there's a luck component that determines um, where somebody sits. And so, you know, our, our value system is supposed to not be based on envy. In fact, envy is very destructive. It's a very, you know, non-Christian idea. And, okay, why do you talk about Christianity so much? Because I think for a proper value, well, first off, I'm a Christian, but uh, for a proper value system, you know, for a proper um, growth, for proper development, for actually for proper stability in a society of a free, freeborn society, you you have to not try to envy. Envy encourages jealousy. It encourages action against your neighbor. And your first rule is to love your neighbor like yourself. There you go. All right. So, yeah, I mean, envy is, envy is dirty. But, yeah, you know, um, I think, I think that, and so, I, and so when you come in from that kind of paradigm or that kind of idea or that kind of ideology and then you go into politics and you see the very communist Bernie Sanders, you see Elizabeth Warren with the trying to push all this legislation that does sound really nice but can really be paid for. Um like her healthcare thing is going to cost trillions and trillions. Um, look, there's a lot of problems here, and not everything can be solved. The Christian way was not was never to take all of your neighbor's money at gunpoint and distribute it evenly amongst everybody else who was remaining, because the, in the Christian value system, hierarchy is not um, a factor. You don't get into heaven because you were the firstborn. You don't get in there because you were a certain skin tone. You don't get in there because you can speak certain languages. You don't get. You don't go there because you happen to go to Harvard. That's not how it works. It's based on a meritis, meritocracy. And yes, there are two people who can work the same, and one just happened to get lucky. Boom, unequal. You know, one happened to be born on the West Coast. The other one happened to be born on the East Coast. And the movie producer was in the East Coast at that time. So he found that guy. He got picked for the movie role. Boom, inequality. It happens all the time. So, you know, it's interesting. But woe is me because woe is us. Um, as a society, societies need to become and be, uh, be vigilant against um, the encroachment of non-Christian Judeo ideas and non-Christian Judeo values, um, precisely because they become, be, they start to destabilize. Because when you start to introduce ideas of selfishness, ideas of envy, ideas of, um, of 
that aren't focused on taking care of other people and instead forcing people to do things, um, you know, deciding who is and who isn't allowed to speak, so on and so forth, you're encroaching on a, on a, on a, on a, some sort of dictatorship. And very quickly, people lose their rights. People lose their individual freedoms. Um, it, it, it can become a hell on earth. And it can become, certainly become a third world sort of reality. You know, you think things are bad now. Things can get a lot worse. All right, we're not living in the slums of Brazil. You know, even the poor in America are way better off than the poor in, in another country. Really, anybody in the Western world is a lot better off than anyone than anybody anywhere else. So these things are worth noting, and they're worth pointing out. But yeah, you know, I kind of just wanted to talk about that. Um, thank you guys for listening, and I will see you guys in the next video. Take it easy. Peace.